Hello everyone and welcome to the Medical Technology Assessment Program for the first semester. So I am Sir Joshua Ian G. Intal and I will be the speaker for Clinical Parasitology. So our seminar for Clinical Parasitology is divided into four parts. So the first part will talk about the phylum nematode or nematoda. The second part will be the platyhelmets. Third part will be the sarcoma stigophora, and the last part will talk about the ciliophora and other apicomplexans. So in this video, or first video rather, we'll talk about first the phylum nematoda. So your phylum nematoda is under the vast world of helminths. So when we say helminths, these are worms. So your helminths are divided into two phylums. We have the phylum nematoda and phylum platyhelminths. So in this video, we'll talk about first the phylum nematoda, which um, comprise of two classes. We have the adenophorea and the class Cesernantia. Okay? So under this, we have your apasmids and pasmid roundworms, okay, All, or also known as nematodes. So let's go first with the phylum nematoda. So here are the general characteristics of your nematodes or roundworms. The first one, they have separate sexes. The term to um, describe separate sexes is what we call diuitious. So these are diuitious parasites that have a female and male counterparts, specifically their adult stage. So, female in general are larger in size than males and they have pointed tails, while, while male are smaller in size and contain a curved tail or what we call the copulatory bursa. So, this curved tail is used to attach okay, to the female during copulation or sexual reproduction. Next one, when it comes to the life cycle, they contain three morphological stages. So, take note, the egg stage the larval stage, or this is also known as juvenile stage, and the adult stage, which uh, contains the adult female and adult male worms. Also, they contain chemoreceptors. So these chemoreceptors, since these are worms, they do not contain eyes and other senses. So these chemoreceptors help them, okay, help the worms or nematodes uh, navigate Okay, the surroundings, especially inside the host. So these chemoreceptors help detect chemical signals okay, around uh, surrounding, okay, in their surroundings. So for ampids, these are cephalic chemoreceptors. That means that these particular chemoreceptors are located anteriorly, okay? Anteriorly or cephalic. Okay, A for anterior. So that means these are in front, okay, of our worms or anterior portion of our worms. Remember, all nematodes have ampid. Next, phasmid. So, phasmid are the counterpart of ampid. No? So, for phasmid, these are also known as caudal chemoreceptors. So, when we say caudal, that means these chemoreceptors are located posteriorly in the adult worms. So, P for posterior. Remember, for nematodes, all nematodes have pasmid except for the TCT. So, your TCT is uh, comprised of trichuris, trichura, capillary, capillaria philippinensis, and trichinella spiralis. So, take note, okay, all nematodes have pasmid except for these three. Okay, this is also, these are also known as apasmid. So, they lack caudal chemoreceptors. Here are the other general characteristics for nematodes. So the fifth one, oviparous. So when we say oviparous, this is a term that describes adult female worms that lay their eggs unsegmented or what we call unembryonated. So that means upon release in the feces of an infected host, these particular um, eggs okay, appear underdeveloped. So we have your HAT. Do not forget the acronym. So this uh, stands for hookworm. Ascaris and Trichuris. So all of these three are oviparous. So they lay an embryonated egg okay, in the feces. So next one is ovoviviparous. So these are adult female worms that lay their eggs segmented or what we call embryonated. So that means upon release in the feces, these eggs are fully developed. So for ovoviviparous female worms, we have what we call the ES. So ES stands for Enterobius vermicularis and Strongyloides stercularis. 
Next is viviparous or larviparous from the word larviparous. So that means these are uh, female worms that lay fully developed larva instead of an egg. So we have um, all tissue nematodes are considered viviparous or larviparous. Next characteristics in terms of frequency. So when we say frequency, how often they are encountered or they are recovered. So this um, particular parasite is acronymed as it. Do not forget the parasite enterobius, followed by the ascaris, and then lastly for trichuris. In terms of habitat, for parasite that reside in the small intestine, do not forget the acronym CASH. So CASH stands for capillaria, ascaris, strongyloides, and hookworm. While parasite that reside in the large intestine, do not forget the term ET. So ET stands for enterobius and trichuris. For parasite that um, specifically their larval stage that um, possess or manifest heart to lung migration, do not forget the acronym ASH. So this can potentially travel, okay, from the intestine to the heart and lungs. We have your ascaris strongyloides, and hookworms. And lastly, um, soil-transmitted helminths. So that means this particular parasite, specifically nematodes, they are mostly okay, encountered or acquired okay, through contaminated soil. We have the hookworm, ascaris, and trichuris, which stands for hat. So as we discussed a while ago, your phylum nematoda is divided into two classes. So the first class that we will be discussing is your class Cesernentia. These are also known as phasmids. Okay? These are phasmid roundworms that contain posterior or caudal chemoreceptors. So your phasmid are divided into two classifications. So we have your intestinal and tissue and extraintestinal roundworms. So we will be talking about all of these parasites in general one by one. So the first um, classes or the first classification of uh, roundworms that we'll be talking about are your intestinal roundworms. So the first roundworm that, uh, that we will be talking about is your Ascaris lumbricoides. So your Ascaris lumbricoides is also known as the giant intestinal roundworm. So this is the largest intestinal nematode okay, in humans. So this is the most common nematode in infection in man. And it has three forms or three egg forms rather. So we have your fertilized, unfertilized, and decorticated. So here are the sample pictures for the Ascaris lumbricoides egg forms. So can you still remember which one of these pictures is the fertilized, unfertilized, and decorticated? So you may pause this video if you want to assess yourself, but let's reveal the answer. So for the first picture, we have the fertilized egg. Okay, this is the most common um, egg form of Ascaris, and it contains three types of layers. Don't forget the inner lipodial vitelin membrane, the middle transparent glycogen layer, and the outer coarsely mammillated albuminous layer. Well, for the second picture, we have the unfertilized. Although they still have um, similar layers, this particular egg form, unfertilized, do not contain a glycogen membrane. So only a inner lipoidal vitalin membrane and a coarsely mammillated albuminous layer. Also, in terms of uh, shape and size, this is longer and narrower than, a, than on a fertilized egg form. Next one, we have the decorticated. So for decorticated, these are uh, eggs that do not contain outer albuminous layer. So as you can see here on this picture, the presence of a transparent outer albuminous layer represents the lack okay, of that particular layer. So in terms of the uh, phytogenicity, only the fertilized one is able to um, produce okay, or to mature into a larval and adult worm. So in terms of Ascaris lumbricoides adults, the only diagnostic morphology is the presence of a triangular trilobate lips. So as you can see here, we have one, two, and three. Okay, trilobate, 
okay, that are positioned on the buccal cavity of the adult worm. In terms of the life cycle, the most important one here is to know the mode of transmission and also the infective stages for each parasite. So for Ascaris lumbricoides, the infective stage is embryonated egg. Okay, So the diagnostic stage, which is uh, helpful in diagnosis, especially during um, lab procedure, is unembryonated. But also you can um, use embryonated egg as well. The mode of transmission is through ingestion of your embryonated egg, okay? The infective stage. The definitive host is human, okay? But also, kindly take note that humans can also be, um, are also the intermediate host, no? So, definitive and intermediate host are differentiated in terms of the reproduction of our, um, of the, our parasite. So, for intermediate host, this houses the larval stages of the parasite. So that means for intermediate hosts, they have larva or juvenile worms inside them. So in terms of Ascaris, we are also the intermediate host. Well, for definitive hosts, definitive, that means these are hosts that contain the mature types or mature morpho uh, forms of a particular parasite. So we still also have the adult worms for Ascaris, so we are still considered definitive host. So we are both definitive and intermediate host for Ascaris lumbricoides. For Ascaris lumbricoides disease, this is called Ascariasis, and some textbook may also describe this as the sandbox infection. This is so-called sandbox because the um, environment where we usually get the embryonated egg of the Ascaris lumbricoides is in contaminated soil or sand. So for people with sandbox infection or ascariasis, they demonstrate okay, ascaris pneumonitis. Pneumo, which means lungs, itis, which means inflammation. So there is inflammation in the lungs and they may also have a low fleur syndrome. So this is a combination of the inflammation in the lungs plus eosinophilia or increased eosinophils in the blood. And this is usually uh, demonstrated when there is a heart-to-lung migration of the larval forms of Ascaris. So, um, I believe we discussed this, no? Yung, um, the presence or the capability of the parasite to, um, to um, invade okay, other organs such as the lungs and the heart. For chronic cases... Adult worms may reside okay, in the small intestine and okay, the presence of the adult worms in that particular area may cause a pot belly or increased size of the abdomen for patient under the chronic stage. So for the diagnosis of Ascaris lumbricoides, we can do the simple method of direct microscopy. So this is also known as the stool exam where we examine Okay, a small amount of um, stool sample under the microscope. Okay, so uh, for patient with pneumonitis and low flare syndrome, we can require them to send a sputum sample. Okay, to check for the presence of the larval forms of Ascaris. We can also um, do X-ray in terms of uh, chronic cases, no, to check for Ascaris bolus. This is what we call the Ascaris bolus on this particular picture, okay? So, the um, presence of an increase or heavy infection of Ascaris in the abdominal area of the patient. The next intestinal roundworm is Enterobius vermicularis. So, your Enterobius vermicularis is also known as the pinworm or the seat worm. So, the old name for Enterobius vermicularis is Oxyuris vermicularis. And this is the causative agent of Proritus ani or what we call the perianal itching. In terms of morphology, Enterobius vermicularis egg are elongated and contain a side that is flattened. So some textbook may also describe these eggs as the D-shaped egg. So let me show you. So as you can see, one side of this uh, egg is flattened. Okay, the other side is concave. For adults, um, don't forget the presence of the cephalic allele or what we call the esophageal bulb. 
So for the life cycle of Enterobis vermicularis, so the infective stage is embryonated egg, just like Ascaris. The diagnostic stage is still embryonated egg, but specifically should be acquired in the perianal region of the patient. The mode of transmission, the most common one, is the ingestion of embryonated egg. There are rare cases that inhalation may happen, but uh, in terms of pathology, this is not um, uh, commonly okay, described in the textbooks. Some of the trans, um, mode of transmission may also um, enumerate auto-infection. No? So when we say auto-infection, since Enterobis vermicularis is an ovoviviparous um, parasite, so that means the female worms lay embryonated egg, this particular parasite may accidentally lay their eggs inside the host, okay? specifically in the large intestine. So what happens? Since these are embryonated, they can already hatch okay, inside the host. So the life cycle will continue inside the particular infected host. That is auto-infection, where eggs hatches inside the uh, host, okay? specifically in the large intestine of the host. Retro-infection, on the other hand, is that when embryonated eggs are deposited in the perianal region of the patient, some of these eggs, since these are embryonated already, may hatch in the perianal region and become larva in the process. Now, this larva okay, may um, enter the perianal or the anal region of the patient and will travel to the large intestine. So, the life cycle still continues inside the host. Retro, which means going back. Okay? So, the definitive and intermediate hosts are uh, still humans. So, for the disease, this is also called as enterobiasis or oxy, uh, oxyuriasis. Okay? So, this is termed as paritus ani. Patient with this particular disease okay, um, experiences itchy anus, insomnia due to the constant scratching. Okay? Um, since this is uh, very... Um, uncomfortable for the patient so during the night okay they uh, may uh, experience sleeplessness uh, sometimes especially when adult worms are um, resides okay are residing in the large intestine in large number abdominal pain may also be felt by the patient okay but remind you uh, but mind you no diarrhea is present okay Although these are very rare to happen, extraintestinal enterobiasis may also um, be experienced by other patients. No? So um, other sites may be affected by the adult worms such as the appendix, appendix, prostate, lungs, and liver. For the diagnosis, the most common one is what we call the perianal swab or the Graham's scotch tape. So I believe if you still remember in your uh, parasitology lab, so this is done early in the morning before defecation and bathing of the particular patient. So most of the time, patients are children. Okay, So you have to be careful in um, acquiring or um, collecting this type of specimen. Okay, So this uh, should be done early in the morning before defecation and bathing of the uh, patient. So here is a simple demonstration of your Graham's scotch tape method. So the clear plastic tape is pulled back over the end of the slide to expose the gum surface. So the tape still attached to the slide is looped over a wooden stick or a tongue depressor. And the gum surface of the tape is touched several times to the anal region. So the tape is replaced on the slide. And the slide is smoothed down with cotton or gauze. And it is then examined under a microscope for pinworm eggs. So the next intestinal roundworms that we will be talking about are the hookworms. So your hookworms are comprised of your Necator americanus or the New World hookworm, sometimes so-called as American murderer. So this is so-called New World because the cases usually are reported in America and other parts of the South America. So for Ancelostoma duodenale, this is 
also known as the old world hookworm because the cases are reported or the first cases are reported in Africa and other parts of Europe. So old world. This is also known as the germ of laziness because sometimes one of the transmission also is through ingestion of hookworm eggs. Okay, so improper hand washing is also the reason why okay, these particular parasites are acquired accidentally. So for Ancelostoma caninum and Ancelostoma brasiliense, these are considered zoonotic. So when you say zoonotic, the definitive host is usually an animal. So for caninum, we have your dog hookworm. For brasiliense, we have the cat hookworm. So let's talk about first the hookworm eggs. So in terms of the species, hookworm eggs are all similar. No? So these are described as ovoidal with thin shell that are colorless, just like here on this picture. So this is so-called morula ball because it contains at least two to eight cell stages. So as you can see here, this resembles a grape-like appearance, no? or also known as morula ball. So now let's go to the hookworm adults. So this is the morphological stage that is best to use to describe or to differentiate the species of hookworms. So here are the um, morphology of hookworm adults. So let's start first with Necator americanus. So in the buccal cavity or buccal capsule of Necator americanus, it contains one median tooth with pair of semilunar cutting plates. Naalala ko si Necator americanus because I always say Necator. Okay? Necator americanus. Cutting plates. Cut. Necator. Okay? Just a, ano lang, um, pampa, uh, alala lang kay Nekator. Okay? Nekator cutting plates. Okay? So, here is a picture of your Nekator americanus. So, their buccal cavity contains cutting plates. Okay? At least four cutting plates in total. So, for Ancelostoma duodenale, the most important one here is to um, memorize the, pe uh, the presence of two ventral pairs of fused teeth. So as you can see here, we have two ventral pairs of fused teeth. Ayan, teeth naman kay Ancelostoma duodenale. For the um, zoonotic hookworms, for Ancelostoma caninum and Brasiliense, take note the um, for vent uh, ventral pairs, caninum have more ventral pairs than Ancelostoma. Specifically, three ventral pairs, while for Brasiliense has two ventral pairs. But in terms of the teeth, for caninum, it has fused, while for brinziliense, it has unfused teeth, just like here on this picture. So another morphological characteristic to differentiate the hookworm adults is through the male copulatory bursa. So this is again used for copulation purposes or sexual reproduction. So for N. americanus, this is bipartite, which means that the spicules is uh, fused and barbed. Well, for Ancelostoma duodenale, the spicules is unfused and not barbed. So, the copulatory bursa is located posteriorly of, uh, under, okay, or in the posterior region of the adult worm. So, here is a more um, zoom-out version of the copulatory bursa of your Necator and Ancelostoma. Again, Necator is bipartite, so that means it contains two types of barbs, okay? in the copulatory bursa of male adult worms. And remember the spicules, as you can see here, the long thread that are present in this copulatory bursa, okay? At the end, these are fused together, okay? Bipartite that has two spicules that are fused together. Well, for Ancelostoma, tripartite, so that means tatlo yung kanyang um, barb. So we have one, two, and three. Tripartite that contains spicules that are unfused. Okay. Unfused spicules or spicules free. So for hookworm life cycle, the infective stage is filariform larva. So instead of the ingestion of embryonated or unembryonated egg, the hookworm life cycle is initiated by the skin penetration of your filariform larva. So these are acquired 
Okay, one of the cause of this particular um, skin penetration is um, walking, okay, in infected soil without protection, okay, such as wearing sh uh, without wearing shoes and sandals or slippers. The, the diagnostic stage for this parasite is an embryonated egg which can be viewed under the microscope. For the, uh, the definitive host and intermediate host, humans are still both, okay? That falls under these two types of categories of hosts. For Ancelostoma caninum and Brasiliense, these are considered ectoparasites. So that means these do not invade the small intestine and the large intestine, but only on the skin, okay? So manifestation of irritation in the skin is visible. So later on, we will show you. So for hookworm disease, uh, for N. americanus, um, associated diseases are ground itch and dew itch. So both of these are skin um, concerns or skin manifestation. So just like here on this picture. So there is an inflammation in the super layer, um, super layer of our skin. So this represents the entry of the larva or the filariform larva of hookworms. So, since hookworm is considered under the age 80, okay, your hookworm, Ascaris and Trichuris, which manifest heart-to-lung migration, so they may also give or may manifest in the patient as Loeffler's syndrome. So, this is again the um, combination of pneumonitis and eosinophilia. So, for chronic cases as well, irons, uh, iron deficiency anemia may also be presented in the patient. For Ancelostoma duodenale, all of the signs and symptoms and diseases is similar to N. americanus but with the addition of Wuhana syndrome. So for Ancelostoma duodenale, aside from the um, parasite or filariform penetration in the skin, this can also be acquired by ingesting the larva directly. So this is by eating okay, uh, food that are contaminated with the larva. Okay? And skin irritation as well is also evident for Ancelostoma duodenale. For Brasiliense, wait lang. For Brasiliense and Caninum, or what we call the zoonotic hookworms, these uh, are cause, okay? This causes cutaneous larva migrants. So when you say cutaneous, that means, okay, these are ectopic skin infections only. Okay, just like here on this picture. This is also known as the creeping eruption because sometimes you may uh, you may observe okay the worm okay the presence of the worm under the superficial layer of the skin. So for hookworm diagnosis, the commonly used one is direct microscopy. Okay, this is acquired or done by acquiring stool sample or a feces sample and viewing it under the microscope okay, by using your saline preparation. We can also increase the um, recovery of this particular parasite by using Katokat's method. Also, we can, for Harada Mori and Coproculture, these are done only an in, service, uh, in surveys and uh, research purposes. Okay, for Harada Mori culture technique, this is done by concentrating, okay, just like here on this picture the larva okay um, of this particular uh, parasite okay and also for coproculture this is done by cultivating the larva of your hookworm in an agar plate medium so here is a simple demonstration of your catocats method so this is a qualitative and semi-quantitative method for the recovery of your hookworm eggs so for catocats, the recommended stool sample is around 41, 41.7 milligrams or mg of stool sample. So this is done by acquiring a stool sample and transferring it in a mesh net. Okay, so in the mesh net, so uh, acquiring it by using your spatula and transferring the filtered uh, stool sample in a template. So this template contains a small hole where we will be concentrating the stool, uh, the stool sample. So upon putting the stool, uh, stool sample in the template, this uh, is the appearance. Okay. 
So you will get a small cir a circle which uh, was formed in the template, okay, which contains the concentrated stool. So um, in cases of catocats, we need at least two specimen. So upon um, collecting two specimen in the glass slide, okay, and transferring it into a template, we can then cover the stool with a cellophane membrane, okay? This cellophane membrane is then um, attached to the template or the stool sample and inverted, okay, by applying gentle pressure with the thumb to spread the stool sample and make a thin preparation, just like here on this picture. So as you can see, um, the sample was spread all throughout the cellophane membrane. So allow the glycerol, which is present on the cellophane membrane, to act for 10 minutes and read the slide using 10 times and 40 times power objective. So um, here on this uh, method, we are looking for the hookworm eggs, okay, by uh, increasing their recovery. So for Harada Moriculture Technique, this is done or used for the um, cultivation of the larval forms of your hookworms. So this is done by using a culture tube with water okay, at the bottom. So we are submerging a strip of filter paper that is smeared with stool sample or feces. Now if the feces contain hookworm eggs, these eggs under the desirable condition will hatch eventually. And these um, eggs, okay, since um, hatching, they will uh, develop into a larva which will then migrate into the water. Now, this water filled with larva is then okay, acquired and transferred into a nutrient agar plate or what we call the coproculture technique. So, we will grow this larva to eventually observe them okay, inside the culture media. So, the next intestinal phasmid roundworms is Strongyloides stercoralis. So, your Strongyloides stercoralis is also known as threadworm. So, this is the causative agent of Cochin China diarrhea and it is considered a facultative nematode. So, when we say facultative, that means it may or may not okay, parasitic in nature. So, remember, your Strongyloides stercoralis, only the female is considered parasitic. So that means inside the host, there is only the presence of female adult worms. These female adult worms reside in the small intestine. So other uh, forms, especially your adult forms, may be free-living, okay? Free-living male and female, which, is, which are found in the soil. So in terms of the morphology for Strongyloides circularis, egg and adult, for eggs, they have similar appearance to hookworm and sometimes may hatch in the intestinal mucosa and may release rhabditiform larva in the feces. So as you can see here, um, this is very similar to hookworm with a thin transparent shell but uh, the inside okay, um, may not contain morula ball or 2 to 8 cell stages. So very compact yung kanyang uh, embryo inside. So for strongyloides, this is considered under the ovoviviparus, just like enterobius. So that means they lay, the er they lay their eggs as embryonated already. So once released, they can turn into a rhabdidiform larva. So that is the feeding stage of the uh, Strongyloides tergoralis. So for adult worms, the female worms are capable of parthenogenesis. So this is the ability of the adult worm to impregnate themselves. So for Strongyloides circularis and hookworm, they both have similar egg forms. That's why it's very important to use other morphological stages to differentiate the two. So both of them contain larval stages of rhabditiform and filariform. So for Strongyloides, they have shorter rhabditiform in the buccal cavity and a larger genital primordium. In terms of the filariform, it has a long esophagus and a notch fork tail. So kindly take note for hookworms, the appearance of their raptitiform and filariform. But it's important to at least memorize 
for strong hyloid dester coralis, the difference okay, of their rhabdidiform and filariform larva from hookworms. In terms of the life cycle, the infective stage is same as the hookworms, no? the filariform larva. So, since filariform larva yan, ang kanilang mode of transmission is, is, to, is through skin penetration. So, the diagnostic stage where we can use to differentiate it from hookworms is your rhabditiform larva. The definitive host is humans, but uh, dogs may also be uh, act as an extra definitive host. For the disease, for strong hyloides, these are very general in nature, no? So it may cause allergic reaction at the site of penetration. For lar uh, larval migration, it may cause pneumonia. And in the intestine, it may cause a very generalized um, abdominal discomfort such as pain, diarrhea, vomiting, weight loss, anemia, and eosinophilia. So this, by the way, is so-called Cochin China disease. No? So this is uh, so-called Cochin China because this is uh, first documented in Cochin, okay, in a rural area of Cochin in the country China. Auto uh, auto reinfection may also uh, is also possible where rhabdidiform larva develops into filariform la larva while in the intestine. So that means they have the capability to um, grow as adult inside also in a specific host. So that is auto reinfec reinfection. So for the diagnosis of strong hyloidester coralis, we can use the very mo uh, very common direct microscopy by using stool sample of the patient. So here we are looking for the rhabdidiform larva to um, differentiate it from the hookworm. Okay? So we can also acquire other samples such as duodenal aspirate by acquiring or using enterotes and Beal's string test. So these are other uh, forms of specimen collection. So later on, we will show you these types of um, specimen collection techniques. So uh, we can also use Hradamori and Coproculture for service, uh, surveys or um, specific research purposes. So here is a entero test or Beal string test. This is attached to the patient okay, by swallowing the gel that is attached to the string. So this is, the, the end part of the string is then taped to the patient cheek for uh, security. Okay? So after a while, this is extracted and all the um, contents that is absorbed by the gel is then acquired and um, examined under the microscope. So the fluid or the aspirate that is absorbed by the gel is then examined. So this is uh, very helpful in terms of patient with no um, parasite seen in the stool exam. So we're done with the intestinal roundworms. Now let's go to the tissue and, and extra intestinal roundworms. So here are all the parasites involved in this particular classification. So remember, for filarial worms and Dracunculus medinensis, these are considered the human parasite. While for Toxocara and the rest, these are zoonotic parasite. That means their definitive host is not usually humans but animals. So let's move on to the first tissue and extra intestinal roundworm. So we have your filarial worms that are comp uh, that is comprised with Wuckeria bancrofti, Brugia malai, Loa loa, Onchocerca volvulus, and the three Mansonella species. So your definitive host for filarial worms is humans. So we harbor the adult stage of the parasite, while the intermediate host slash the vector are arthropods. No? So later on, we will show you which arthropods are present on this specific filarial worms. The infective stage of filarial worms is the L3 larva or the third stage larva, which is introduced by the vector upon biting the human host. 
the, diagnos uh, the diagnostic stage is microfilaria, which can be seen or acquired in the blood sample or tissue sample of the patient. So let's go to the first filarial worm, and that is your Wuchereria bancrofti. So your Wuchereria bancrofti is also known as the Bancroft's filaria and the lower filaria. So this attacks the lymphatic system of the patient, and the vector or the intermediate host is a mosquito. So there are three ge uh, genus under this, and we have your anophil uh, Anophilus, Culex, and Aedes. So this is termed as the lower filariasis, where elephantiasis under the uh, in the lower extremities of the patient is evident. So just like here on this picture, so there is the enlargement of the um, area, okay, the lower extremities of the patient. It can also, for male patient, may produce chylocyl. So this is the um, enlargement of the scrotum of male patient. This is due to the destruction of the lymphatic vessels surrounding the scrotal area of the patient. So the fluid is liberated, hence okay, making the larger appearance of a particular organ or site. Kyluria, on the other hand, is the presence of a milky urine because of the presence of lymphatic fluid in that area. So some lymphatic fluid may travel from the um, scrotum to the bladder of the patient, eventually being evident in the urine okay, as milky or uh, milky inconsistency or appearance. So again, kyluria is the presence of a milky fluid in the urine. Well, hydrocele is the presence of a clear fluid okay, in the urine. Also, for Wuchereria bancrofti, they may also travel, okay, um, aside from lower filariasis, may also travel in the lungs, okay, causing tropical pulmonary eosinophilia. So, this is characterized by pulmonary um, signs and symptoms such as coughing, difficulty in breathing, and inflammation in the uh, lung area. Next is Brugia malayi. So, Brugia malayi is also known as the Brugian filaria, Malayan filaria, and the upper filaria. Again, this is only just to differentiate it from Wuchereria. But upper filaria, okay, is not, um, is not a precise term to describe Brugia malayi because Brugia malayi may also cause elephantiasis in the lower extremities. But uh, just to differentiate it, Okay, this is more common in the upper ex extremities of the patient, just like here on this picture, such as the arms, okay, the lymphatic vessels of the arms, and okay, the upper extremities. So again, just like your Wuchereria, this attack the lymphatic system of our patient. So for Brugia malayi, the only mosquito vector is under the genus Mansonia. So this is termed as upper filariasis, where elephantiasis in the upper extremities of the patient is manifested. So this is similar to Bancroftian except for Carluria. So there is no presence of the pre um, milky urine because nga, this is upper filariasis. So most of the time, the, um, the, the area that is attacked is the upper extremities of the patient. Next is Loa Loa. So this is also known as the African eye worm, and this attack the subcutaneous tissue of the patient or host. So uh, specifically, the eye area of the patient causing swelling. So the vector or the intermediate host is a mango fly or a deer, a deer fly or a tabinid fly that uh, is under the genus Chrysops. So, the disease is calabar swelling or fugitive swelling. Okay? Next one is Onchocerca volvulus. So, this particular parasite is also known as convoluted filaria or blinding worm. So, this also attacks the subcutaneous tissues just like loa loa. And this is propagated by the black fly or the buffalo gnat under the genus Simulium damnosum. So, the disease is your blinding filariasis or river blindness. So this is so-called river blindness because the uh, intermediate host or the vector buffalo fly or the black fly is usually found in river, okay, or yung mga running water. 
So, onchocercomata is also evident in patient with onchocerca volvulus parasite in the eye area. Okay? In chronic cases, this may cause blinding. Okay? The destruction of the blood vessels surrounding your eye, causing blindness. Hanging groin may also be evident, but quite rare to happen. This is usually the patient affected with this are people with no apparent um, protective clothing. So this may also be okay. Uh, may also be resided okay or introduced in the air uh, lower extremities, causing ayan, hanging groin. Uh, hanging groin. Leopard skin may also be uh, evident in patient with this particular parasite. So, next is the Mansonella species. So, let's differentiate them in terms of their habitat, their vector, and their disease. So, for Mansonella perstans, the habitat is in the mesentery of the infected host. So, mesenteries are tissues surrounding your uh, abdomen. Okay? So, this may cause caliber-like swelling, just like loa loa. And this is also known as the Kampala or Ugandan eye worm. Next is Mansonella streptocerca. This invades the dermis and subcutaneous tissues. So since um, these are very superficial in nature, their disease is um, manifested as dermatitis. No? So the inflammation of your dermis, okay, pruritic, that means makate, okay, very itchy dermatitis or inflammation in the dermis of your skin. Next is Mansonella ozardi. This resides in the subcutaneous tissues. And their disease is asymptomatic. No? There are no recorded case of um, disease that is caused by Manzonella ozardi. So patients usually recover without, prop, uh, without treatment. So all of them, their vector is the biting midge, culicoides. So in terms of the specimen, periodicity and appearance, and also the method, for Wukeriria bancrofti, we can use this uh, blood specimen. No? So, kung specimen niya is blood, the method is a blood smear. So, the periodicity, when we say periodicity, so how often we can extract okay, the parasite in the blood. So, we can expect that for Wukeriria bancrofti, this is a nocturnal parasite. So, that means the highest recovery may be acquired during 10 p.m. to 2 a.m. So, during night time. So, this is uh, some cases or some reference may also consider Wukeriria bancrofti as diurnally subperiodic. So, that means that they can also be acquired during the day. But, remember, for Wukeriria, nocturnal talaga siya. No? Strictly, um, facultatively nocturnal. So, the highest recovery is acquired during the day. So, for the appearance of their microfilaria, so later on we will show you pictures of this, but remember for Wukeriria bancrofti, their microfilaria are sheeted with uh, tail that is free from nuclei. This is also known as the graceful appearance parasite. And the method is still blood smear. For Brugia malai, the specimen is still blood, and this is nocturnal subperiodic. So, compared to Wukeriria, Brugia malai is called nocturnal subperiodic. That means the, um, it may also be acquired during the day, but the highest recovery is still nocturnal or during the night. So for microfilaria, it is still sheeted just like Wukeriria, but it has a two discrete nuclei at the tip of the particular parasite. But compared to your Wukeriria, your Brugia malai is kinky in appearance or irregular. Next is Loa Loa. So, since Loa Loa may also travel to other parts of the body, they can um, specimen or we can use other specimen uh, aside from blood such as CSF, urine, and sputum. But the most commonly one is still blood. So, this is the urinal. So, compared, uh, compared to the two uh, first filaria, Loa Loa is highest recovered during the day. So, in terms of their microfilaria, just like Wukeriria and Bruji, Loa Loa is still sheeted, but their nuclei is irregularly spaced to the tip. So, all of these are acquired or um, observed um, by using blood smear. So, here is the specific samples of your 
uh, microfilaria for the uh, filaria worms. So here is your Wuchereria bancrofti. So this has a micro, I uh, sorry, a, a graceful appearance. No? So their nuclei, just like here, let me annotate. Sorry. So as you can see on this uh, area, it has a tail-free nuclei. While for Brugia malai, it, uh, it has a kinky appearance or irregular appearance and their micro uh, uh, and the nuclei okay at the tip of the tail is uh, or, or contains two discrete nuclei where for loa loa this is also sheeted but contains an irregularly spaced nuclei at the tip just like here on this picture so here are the other filarial worms so most of these especially on their microfilaria, are all unsheeted. So as you can see, uh, in terms of Mansonella streptocerca, this is also described as the shepherd's crook appearance or a walking stick microfilaria. In terms of their periodicity, all of them are non-periodic or what we call the aperiodic. So there are no, uh, there is no specific time of the day where they can be extracted the highest. So they can be extracted any time of the day. And in terms of their diagnosis, most of them, especially for Perstans and Mansonella ozardi, all of them can be acquired or viewed in the blood smear, except for Volvulus, which requires Mazotti test, and Mansonella streptocerca. So here is the Mazotti test. So this is basically just applying a DEC patch. DEC stands for Diethylcarbamazine. So your diethylcarbamazine patch, okay, is attached to the patient's arm. So if the patient is uh, infected with filarial worms, specifically for volvulus and uh, streptocerca, those worms invade the subcutaneous tissues. So these particular uh, worms are killed by the DEC patch. The deposits or the um, products of destruction of these worms causes a swelling or a, an arrhythmia. Okay, around the patient's forearm, connoting the positive identification or positive presence of these filarial worms. So here are the sample microfilaria pictures of Onchocerca volvulus and Mansonella perstans. So for volvulus, as you can see, both of, uh, by the way, both of them are unsheeted. So for volvulus, as you can see, their tail is free from nuclei, while for Mansonella, tail or nuclei rather extends to the tip and lastly we have Mansonella streptocerca and Mansonella ozardi so for streptocerca this resembles a shepherd's crook or a walking stick appearance no? with their nuclei almost uh, reaching to the tip while for Mansonella ozardi the tail is free from nuclei the next tissue pasmid is Dracunculus medinensis. So Dracunculus medinensis is also known as the guinea worm, the serpent worm, the medina worm, and the fiery serpent of the Israelites. This is also the longest nematode of man at around more than 800 milliliters. So in terms of the pathology, it attacks the subcutaneous tissues of the patient causing an ulcer in, uh, usually at their lower extremities. In terms of the life cycle, your Dracunculus medinensis is acquired through ingestion of contaminated water, usually uh, containing copepods, just like here on this picture, these are copepods, which act as the intermediate host for this particular parasite. Also, uh, aquatic animals may also serve as a separate or paratinic intermediate host. When we say paratinic, this means they can be extra intermediate host, but not naturally compared to your copepods. So the intermediate host would be cyclopes and aquatic animals. The definitive host of this parasite is humans and the infective stage is the L3 larva. So this L3 larva is the one that uh, infects the definitive host which is humans. And the diagnostic stage would be the L1 larva. In terms of the laboratory diagnosis, so there are no specific uh, methods to use for this particular parasite. So the only 
um, method that we can use is by observing or physical observation of infected ulcer. So this can be uh, induced by immersing the ulcer in cold water. No? So the ulcer will rupture and the L1 larva containing also the female worm will be liberated in the ulcer. So we're done with class Cernentia or what we call the Phasmids. So we'll move forward to class Adenophorea or the Apasmid. So remember, again, Apasmids do not contain posterior chemoreceptors, hence the name Apasmid. So the absence of Pasmid. So the first one is Trichuris trichura. So this is also known as the whipworm. And the infective stage is embryonated egg, just like your Ascaris. So in terms of the definitive host, we are the only definitive host for this particular parasite. In terms of the morphology for Trichuris trichura, so the egg is barrel shape and lemon shape with bipolar hyaline plugs, just like here on this picture. Some textbook uh, describe this particular egg as the Japanese lantern egg. So for the adult, although um, not, uh, not as clinically significant as the egg, both of these, the male and female, are attenuated. So when we say attenuated, these are sharp, okay, posteriorly. In terms of the esophagus, they have a whip-like esophagus. For males, they are uh, coiled, uh, especially their posterior end, okay, due to their copulatory bursa. And for female, they are bluntly rounded, okay, in terms of their posteriors. And, okay, most of the female worms are oviparous, so that means they lay their egg, okay, unembryonated. So, for Trichuris trichura, the pathology behind this is what we call the trichuriasis. So, in terms of light infection, patients infected with this particular parasite experiences abdominal pain and dysentery or diarrhea. Heavy infections may result into rectal prolapse, just like here on this picture. So, the presence of the adult worms for Trichuris trichura in the large intestine may cause the large intestine to be um, unstable, so not integrable enough that it falls off okay, to the rectum of the patient. So, this can cause microcytic anemia as well, and it co-infects with Ascaris plus hookworm. Okay, please add hookworm because all of these three, your Ascaris, hookworms, and Trichuris, are all soil uh, transmitted helminths. No? So, sometimes these three can be seen in one single specimen. So, diagnosis is direct microscopy, especially uh, viewing the egg, okay, the presence of a barrel shape or lemon shaped egg with bipolar hyaline plugs. The next one is Capillaria philippinensis. So this is an endemic uh, parasite from the Philippines, specifically in Barangay Pudok, Ilocos, hence the name Pudok worm. So the infective stage of this parasite is the larva and the intermediate host would be the freshwater fishes under this common name. So for definitive host, we as humans act as a definitive host where we ingest okay, undercooked fish uh, infected with the larva. So in terms of the morphology, uh, this resembles, especially their egg, resembles the Trichuris trichura. So these are guitar, peanut shape with flattened bipolar plugs. There are some case, um, references or books that um, say or describe this particular egg as the Chinese lantern egg. So for the adult, these are delicate tiny worms. For male, it has a chitinized spicule and for female, has an egg in utero. So the pathology behind Capillaria philippinensis is intestinal capillariasis. So this was back then described as the mystery disease due to the fact that Capillaria philippinensis was not documented well in textbooks. So host experiences abdominal pain, diarrhea, and borborygmy. So when we say borborygmy, this is the gurgling sound in the stomach. So auto-infection is also possible in this uh, parasite. And the diagnosis is direct microscopy. So the next one is Capillaria hepatica. So this is a rare parasite under the genus Capillaria and it attacks the liver. So hence the name or the species name hepatica. So the infective stage of this parasite is embryonated egg and the definitive host is still humans. 
This is by ingestion of embryonated egg okay, or fecal oral root. So in terms of their morphology for the egg, this, is, uh, this also resembles the Trichuris and other uh, capillary species. So these are lemon shape with pitted, pitted gold fall appearance, just like here on this picture. So we say pitted, so that means parang kinagat-kagat, no? especially on their outer shell. So adult resembles Trichuris trichura. So the pathology behind uh, capillary hepatica is hepatic capillariasis. So this uh, resembles infectious hepatitis. And it is characterized by having increased leukocytes in the blood, specifically eosinophils, hepatomegaly due to the presence of adults in the liver, and a persistent fever which may be as high as 40 degrees. So in terms of the diagnosis, only liver biopsy is the method to be used for this parasite. So the last apasmid that we'll be discussing is trichinella spiralis. So this is considered as a tissue nematode and this is also known as trichina worm. So the infective stage of this parasite is encysted larva, just like here on this picture. So these particular larva are protected by a covering, usually found in the skeletal muscles of infected hosts. So the diagnosis, uh, diagnostic stage is also encysted larva in muscles. So for humans and other carnivores or meat-eating um, animals, we act as the intermediate and definitive host. So for humans, we are also considered as dead-end hosts, okay? Because cannibalism is not uh, common to us, no? So the, usually kasi, ang, the mode of transmission of this parasite is by ingesting the meat, okay? Where it is infected with encysted larva. So the only time these encysted larva are can be transferred from one host to another is through predation or okay, eating the infected meat. Okay. So in terms of the morphology, so your trichinella spiralis do not have an egg form. No? So this is already a larva. Hence, this particular female worm, especially the adult, are larviparous. No? So they lay Okay, larva instead of an egg. So, in terms of their larva, these are spear-like burrowing anterior tip, just like here on this picture. So, uh, this helps them burrow their way to the skeletal muscles and tissues of the patient. So, in terms of the adult, males have conical, uh, conical papillae and females have club-shaped uterus. So in terms of the disease, this is also known as trichinosis. So it has uh, three stages. So the first stage is what we call the intestinal invasion. So based on the word intestinal, so adults are more associated with this where it causes edema, inflammation, abdominal, and diarrhea to the patient. So these adults or worms are present in the large intestine of the, uh, of the infected host. Stage 2 is the larval migration, so where larva will go through the, uh, will go to the skeletal muscles and other serrated tissues of the patient. So this causes fever because of the presence of the larva in the blood and facial edema. Okay, so since there is the pre uh, presence of larva in the blood, eosinophils are increased. And the last is the convalescence stage. So when we say convalescence, this is where the patient okay, do not have signs and symptoms or what we call the asymptomatic stage. So the presence of the larva are already encysted in the tissues of the infected host. So in terms of diagnosis for trichinella spiralis, the recommended method is the muscle biopsy where we check for the encysted larva present in the serrated or skeletal muscles of the infected host, just like here on this picture. Serological testing may also be possible by using the bentonite flocculation test. So this uses serum where we can detect antibodies against trichinella spiralis. ELISA can also be used as diagnostic test. Next one is the skin test. Specific for trichinella spiralis, this is what we call the Bachmann intradermal test. So later on, we'll be discussing this in separate slide. Lastly, we have the Bex sinodiagnostic test. This is by using albino rats or mice and letting these particular uh, animals feed okay, on an infected tissue. So of course, we will be um, 
uh, doing muscle biopsy or muscle extraction from the suspected host. So if the particular tissue contains the larva or the encysted larva, the rats will also develop encyst um, larva okay, or trichinosis in their muscles. So here is the Bachmann intradermal test. So this is done by injecting 1 is to 5,000 or 1 is to 10,000 dilution of larval antigen. Okay, so this is done by injecting this uh, antigen to the patient. So if the patient contains antibodies against trichinella spiralis, the larval antigen will interact with the antibodies present in the patient's blood causing antigen-antibody reaction. So the presence of this antigen-antibody reaction is connoted by a will or an erythema within 15 to 20 minutes. So that ends our part 1 for the nematodes. So kindly go over to the second part for platyhelminths.